Hello everyone and welcome to the Movie Fanatics, my name is Brannick. I like Mario. Sue me. I've technically been a Mario fan ever since I played Mario Kart 8 on the system I don't own. And that was the only Mario game I ever played until quarantine. And it's not even a mainline one. My real introduction to the popular series of platformers was New Super Mario Bros. 2. It's a wonder I'm still here today. Nah, I like this one. That's why I haven't touched it since my initial playthrough. Then I was alerted to the fact that Super Mario Galaxy was in my house. My younger brothers had played it a few years back on the what, and I never knew. And so I began my first ever playthrough of Super Mario Galaxy. In a year of mostly online classes, I really enjoyed going downstairs from my desk right after school to play this game. I am a five-year-old. I enjoyed the game so much that I got enough stars to beat the game. I beat the game, and then it froze during the final cutscene. I went back in, I beat Bowser again, the game froze in the exact same spot of the cutscene, I gave up. Then Super Mario 3D All-Stars was announced and Galaxy was a part of the package. Alongside Sunshine and 64, I had to get the game. I got it a few months after it came out. Now you'd think I'd play Galaxy first, but no, I played them in release order. I beat the game, then I fully completed it as Mario, then I fully completed it as Luigi, then I sulked, then a few months later I did it all again as both characters. So now with that background, let's talk about this thing. I've wanted to talk about Galaxy for a while on the channel. But it's not a movie, it's a game. Then I realized that nothing is stopping me. This is Super Mario Galaxy. Does story matter to Mario games? Yes and no. Obviously at their core, every Mario game has basically the same story. Most all of them are about Bowser kidnapping Peach. And sometimes this is fine. 3D World just has Bowser kidnapping some fairies at the beginning and then the rest is just gameplay. However, the more memorable Mario games, my favorite Mario games, have more than that. Galaxy takes itself super seriously, and I think it works. The game treats itself like it's a cinematic marvel. The game starts with the Star Festival, celebrating the comet that flies by the Mushroom Kingdom once every century. Mario runs with his arms outstretched, eager to go eat cake with Peach and see the comet. Then Bowser's fleet crashes the party, firing down on the town and freezing toads in ice. He takes Peach's entire castle and Kamek shoots Mario out into the unknown as Bowser flies away. Mario wakes on a small planet and meets Rosalina, who takes him to her ship, the Comet Observatory, after the first mission. The ship's power stars were drained by Bowser and Rosalina and her Luma children were on the verge of death. So you spend the game collecting power stars to power up the observatory to get to the center of the universe and rescue Peach. Bowser has been using the stars to create his own galaxy, planning to use it to rule the universe. Upon defeating him, Peach's castle, Bowser's fleet, and the observatory are all sucked into a black hole created by the destruction of Bowser's galaxy. Then the Lumas all fling themselves into the black hole and create a supernova or something and reset the universe. Everyone is then in the Mushroom Kingdom, and it seems that Mario is the only one who remembers what happened. Roll credits. And that's not even mentioning the library section of the game where you learn about Rosalina's tragic backstory. I love that this is not required to beat the game. It's just a little optional thing to flesh out her character. So story is important here. It makes the game more interesting, much more interesting than if the game just said, Mario's in space, go. I don't think Mario's outings need a lot of cutscenes, just an interesting premise to push the gameplay forward, though the cutscenes are actually really awesome in this game. The story in Galaxy works to motivate the player to move forward, save the Luma, stop Bowser, rescue Peach, and it perfectly ties all the gameplay together. Speaking of gameplay, man is this game fun. First of all, Mario controls wonderfully. That's kind of the standard though, I don't think there's a Mario game where Mario isn't fun to control. In order for the game to be playable with just a Wiimote and Nunchuck, they cut down the number of directions that Mario is allowed to move. Nintendo also nerfed his moveset, you can't dive in this game. <sighs> Nintendo! But you have a new move, the spin. <laughs> Nintendo! The spin is one of my favorite additions to Mario's moveset. It's useful in a variety of situations. You can use it as an attack, you can correct for a poorly placed jump, you can jump higher, longer, infinite possibilities. Using the combination of the long jump and spin, I discovered some really fun skips you can do. The long jump is a galaxy player's best friend. And the level design is out of this world. <laughs> 64 was a sandbox Mario game. The player was placed in a level and told to just run around and find the objectives. You could do the missions out of order, you could skip missions, Secrets were hidden all over the place. Sunshine took this and made it more restrictive. You could no longer do missions out of order, and you had to do the first seven missions of every level in order to progress. I adore Sunshine. I think it's better than 64 overall, but I'm not the biggest fan of how it cut back on the freedom we had in that first game. Sunshine took the first small step in bringing 3D Mario down the path towards being more linear and course clear in design though it was still definitely a sandbox Mario game. Galaxy is a hybrid of the two main design styles. You can't do missions out of order, but the number of stars required to get to the final Bowser is much less than the total number of stars in the game. So if you don't want to do a star in one level, do a different star in a different level. 
and while most levels are linear in design, there are some that have an exploration aspect to them. Honey Hive Galaxy and Beach Ball Galaxy both come to mind. While they're much smaller than the levels in the two preceding games, they still offer room for exploration, and they're some of the more open stages in the game. And because the game was set in space, the developers were allowed to have full creativity about how they designed the levels. Sunshine took place on Isle Delfino, and all the levels were at least somewhat tropical themed. The levels were still creative, and I don't dislike any of them, really. But with Galaxy, all the rules were off the table. We're in space, anything is possible. Bees, penguins, fire and ice, the same level twice. This is something I cannot excuse. I love Goldleaf Galaxy, but it's just the Honey Hive Galaxy mirror. That's very lame. The levels are also unique because a lot of them aren't just one location. They're a collection of smaller planets in one, well, galaxy. This might seem intimidating. We've never had to run around a sphere before. But luckily for the player, Galaxy has wonderful pacing. After the thrilling opening, you find yourself on a tiny little planet. Some Lumas transform themselves into rabbits, and you all play hide-and-seek. That might sound dumb, but I like that this game gives you a moment to catch your breath before shooting you off into the unknown again. And it shows that this game will have its slower moments. And it is a great introduction to the new form of movement. The game holds your hand for just long enough for you to get used to it before letting you go off onto the adventure. With so many possibilities for ideas, it might seem easy that the game could lose its focus and become too disconnected. Galaxy simply doesn't struggle with this. Each level has an immersive theme that it sticks to. Space Junk Galaxy is calming and atmospheric. It's just a tranquil journey through a pocket of space infested with various trash. Gusty Garden Galaxy is triumphant. It's exhilarating. You glide from tiny planet to tiny planet on flowers with a gorgeous blue sky in the background. Battle Rock Galaxy features you traversing outside as the game showcases the rock's cannons before you go inside and destroy the Battle Rock from within. Even more standard Mario themes are recontextualized. We've seen water levels before, but we've never seen a giant floating bowl of water with penguins. That's something new. Ice and lava levels are pretty standard, but Freeze Flame Galaxy combines the two to create a thoroughly interesting set of missions involving the merging of both themes. This game takes classic Mario tropes and reinvents them. On the power-up side of things, Galaxy is a mixed bag. There are some that I love, some that I hate, and some that I'm in between on. I love the bee mushroom. It's such a weird concept, but it's really fun to fly around in. This power-up creates new opportunities for traversal. You can only stand on the flowers as Bee Mario, but touching water makes you lose the suit. One of my favorite levels in the game is where you have to pick between the Boo Mushroom and the Bee Mushroom in order to fly through a tunnel filled with hazards. This level forces the player to choose which power-up you want to use taking into account both power-ups pros and cons. If you lose the power-up, it's an instant death, so choose carefully. The bee suit can only fly for a limited time, so you need to conserve your energy in order to make it across safely, while still needing to dodge the water cannons that will deprive you of the power-up. On the other hand, the boo mushroom has unlimited flight, but it can be killed by beams of light, which just so happened to be here. That's a clever utilization of two power-ups. Another great one is in Freeze Flame Galaxy. On this narrow path, you switch between running on lava and running on ice using the ice flower while still keeping the power-up's time limit in mind. Speaking of time limits, why? Why are the fire and ice flowers on a time limit? I think it would be cooler if they weren't. Also, the red star is such a cool power-up, but it's not in any levels. It's in one level in the hub world, and that makes me sad. This power-up is awesome and fits a space-themed game like a glove, but you can never use it. And then there are the power-ups and mechanics I just don't like. The spring mushroom is so annoying to control. It's more fun to do the levels it's featured in without the power-up where possible. The motion controls in this game are fine. You shake the Wiimote to spin, and it works fine. However, the ball, manta, and bubble sections using the motion controls just aren't that great. The rolling ball is really finicky. In the original game, you'd hold the remote like a joystick and tilt where you wanted the ball to go. I get why it's motion controlled. If buttons were an option for this, it'd just be normal level, basically. But the manta ray race definitely could have been better if controlled by buttons. For this one, you point the Wiimote at the TV and turn it like a key to go left or right. These levels have the potential to be so much fun, but they're held back by obligatory Wii nonsense. And while these were annoying on the Wii, or in my case, the huh, they felt right for the console that they were on. For the Switch port, I was really hoping that they would give these sections proper button controls. But no. This would be fine if you're holding two Joy-Con, but for Switch Lite owners like me, you're forced to awkwardly tilt the system to control these levels. You use the Wiimote's pointer to operate pole stars, collect star bits, and do the bubble minigames. For the Switch port, the pointer functionality is moved to the touchscreen. I got really nervous when I heard this. I expected the pointer to be controlled by the right stick, but I actually like the change. It's actually really comfortable to be playing and then lackadaisically swipe on the screen to collect star bits, and using the touchscreens for the bubble and pole star sections is a breeze. But I will always advocate for more options for control in games. 
So while I like the touchscreen, the option to map that functionality to the right stick would have been nice. There are quite a few stars in Super Mario Galaxy. In order to fully complete the game, you need to get all 120, and that includes the 15 Purple Comet stars unlocked after beating the final Bowser. Once collecting all 120 and beating Bowser a second time, you unlock Super Luigi Galaxy. What's this? It's the same game again, but you play as Luigi. I actually like this. Now play the whole game again, and after you get 120 stars a second time as Luigi, you've unlocked Grand Finale Galaxy. Get the star there as both Mario and Luigi, and then, and only then, have you fully, fully completed the game. This is cool. It's not the best completion incentive that Mario's had, but I still love it. Maybe it's just because Luigi is my favorite Mario character, but I think unlocking him and getting to play the whole adventure again is a really nice bonus. There are also these sections of the game where, as Mario, you have to rescue Luigi, but when playing as Luigi, they didn't change it, so you rescue Luigi as Luigi. And as for the mysterious grand finale galaxy, you'd expect it to be a challenging gauntlet like the other 3D Mario games. But that trend only really got started with Galaxy 2. Galaxy's final level is just a purple comet mission in the Starburst. That might seem lame, and if you think it is, I see why, but I still love it. It seems very in character for Galaxy to reward the player with what they were deprived of in the beginning. After the whole adventure, Mario finally gets to do what he wanted to do in the beginning. Enjoy a peaceful evening at the Star Festival just as it was planned. This level has almost every NPC in the game at the festival, and I always go around and talk to all of them because there are some really funny jokes here. And when you finally reach the castle, you aren't greeted by Peach. Why not? The random toad waiting for you at the castle doors gives you a letter from the developers thanking you for playing the game. I always love that. Grand Finale Galaxy is such a subversive yet charming ending, and this game didn't really need a brutally tough last level as a reward because the journey was the reward. And playing the game twice to get there doesn't feel grueling because Galaxy's pacing is immaculate. It's on the easier side, but the difficulty slowly progresses up to the end, and the Purple Comet missions in the post-game add an extra challenge. Of course, there are some levels that feel like Sunshine-esque pachinko machines. God, I hate that level. Things like the stupid bomb trash minigame, Lava Spire Daredevil Run, Luigi's Purple Coins, these always gave me a tough time on my first playthrough, but they were much easier on subsequent playthroughs. Except the trash game in Dreadnought Galaxy, that's my least favorite star in the entire game. The Bowser fights in this game are my favorite in the series. They're no harder than any of the other Bowser fights, but the developers really turned it up to 11 in terms of making these feel really cinematic. And a lot of that epic feeling gained by playing this game comes from the music. Oh my dear lord, the music in this game is so incredible. I'm sorry, Revenge of the Sith, but this is my favorite soundtrack of all time. Movie, video game, anything. This trumps them all for me. Galaxy utilizes an orchestra for the majority of its levels, highlighting the grandiose nature of space exploration. But the music isn't always grand, each piece reflects its respective stage perfectly. Ghostly Galaxy has this eerie waltz, and the opening notes during this part are D-E-A-D-E-A-D. -E the music literally spells out dead, that's pretty cool. <laughs> then you have this fun, tropical sounding music for Beach Ball Galaxy. <laughs> the music for the Common Observatory progresses in three stages as you move through the game and power the ship. Bowie Base Galaxy is this imposing floating fortress, so we get a thundering orchestral piece. Part of this level is underwater, and when you're underwater, the music changes, and we get this haunting organ. can also calm down and be very peaceful, like the music that plays when Rosalina reads her storybook. This is also basically the Limbus theme. The music for the final Bowser fight is on another level. Never before have I been so excited to fight Bowser. <laughs> Now 
And my favorite video game song of all time is the music for Gusty Garden Galaxy. This piece literally made me want to play the game when I heard it, and I've loved it ever since. This piece also accompanies one of my favorite levels in the game. It's upbeat, it's bright, it's celebratory, and the music reflects this, and it all comes crashing down in a beautiful climax. This piece represents everything I love about Galaxy. The wonder, the excitement, the feeling of freedom. It's what makes this game special to me. Super Mario Galaxy is an important game to me. It's my favorite Mario game. It's the one that has amazed me since my first playthrough. It's the one that revolutionized what 3D Mario could be. Galaxy is ever awe-inspiring, exciting, thrilling, somber, and most of all, fun. Here I am in high school, fondly reminiscing about a game made for children, but who cares? Even if I am too old for this game, I love it nonetheless. One day when I'm older, I won't be surprised to find myself relishing in the fond memories of landing in Gusty Garden, running around the Comet Observatory, collecting star bits, swimming with penguins, and soaring through the vast realm of space. These memories will never leave me, and no matter how many more Mario games come and go, Galaxy will always hold a special place in my heart. And after all, I know the Comet Observatory is still out there, soaring through the cosmos. Its proud white tail, glittering in the sky. This is Brannick from the Movie Fanatics, signing off.